We're going to do a double act, a bit like Laurel and Hardy here. Um, we thought we'd both stand up together and chat through. And as the chairman said, do, there are not many of us, so do break in and stop our monologue when you get bored of it. Um, just to remind you, the, what we're trying to do with this trust, and it is a privilege to run it, because it is unconstrained. Everywhere else, when you run money, you have a risk department breathing down your neck, telling you, you can't do this, you've got too much of that, it's gone up too much, it's too good a company, you need to reduce a bit to get the portfolio back into shape. We do have these debates in the board, but they're conducted at a level where it's much less constrained. We've got to make those freedoms count, haven't we, Colin, and get better performance as a result. So it's, it's unconstrained. We can buy large, medium or small companies. We're not being corralled into a narrow number of big stocks, not being made to buy just income stocks. We've got freedom. And the chairman said how many meetings there are to do. We could do a lot more. If, in our universe, I think there are about 1,250 stocks. There are about, a thousand, about 900 on AIM we could invest in. We don't. And a lot of them are very poorly researched. Our <coughs> job is to try and find the opportunities there. They are there. We just need to find them and make them count. And I hope in this presentation we're going to talk about some that we think will grow and be successful. We'll also talk about some things we've got wrong. Um, the, um, uh, an advert to start with. Yeah. I'm, not sure, I'm sure you all read Money Wise. Um, <laughs> I'd be very surprised if you do. But anyway, they put us the best UK growth trust. Um, morning stars, four star rating. I was asked if there's a five star rating. I don't know. Better try. Better work harder at that next year, Chairman. Um, our active stance, that's the new buzzword in the industry. Um, it, it is like the one below tracking error. Active stance is the amount that you have that isn't type isn't exactly the index weighting. And at the moment, everyone likes to see a high number on active stance. Um, of course, there are periods uh, when I've been told, you know, your tracking error is too high, James. Not by this board, but by other boards. Um, totally the opposite. It means you need a low, low active stance if you want your tracking error low. So these, you have to be careful with these things. But what it does show is we're not closely correlated to the market. We have got that freedom. And that freedom we've got to make count. But we're not doing it by turning over the portfolio fast. We are holding shares because we believe in them. And stories come out slowly and over time. And our holding period is four to five years, i.e. the portfolio turnover is about 20%. And our fees, the fee is, is a higher fee than some trusts. That is because we are spending a lot of time doing our own research. Um, it's capped after the performance, maximum performance it's be at 1.65. Now, that's the background. What's, what's the portfolio and where, where are we? The UK is 50% of the earnings of the underlying companies. That would be more than in many, much more than in the index. Um, and I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not apologising about that. People love to play down how much they've got in the UK. Actually, we're not like that. There are a lot of good companies in the U UK. There are a lot of very exciting things happening in the UK. And we'll talk about some of those areas, like the spin-outs uh, that are coming out of our universities. I've never seen the buzz of commercialisation from our... From universities like I am at the moment. You know, the professor no longer says to you, I've got two new papers coming out in a, in a scientific journal. They tell you, you know, I'm raising money on the stock market because I'm going to create a this really exciting company. The atmosphere is changing and, it, and it, we want to participate in that. The rest, but we do need diversification and we have got, through our holdings in these UK companies, earnings being made around the globe. And then on the other side, we're showing the balance sheet strength of companies. Companies in the UK have become stronger in recent years in balance sheet terms. People have paid down corporate debt. And um, so 33% of the companies have net cash now on their balance sheet. Not only have they paid their debt down, they've actually got money in, on deposit. Some of those companies are, and we'll show you, are, aren't making money at the moment. They're, they've raised the money and they're spending it, but some of these, particularly these university startups. Um, and 
48% of the portfolio is in companies that are making good profits but have debt. And I think that there isn't a right way to run a company. Debt is sometimes a good discipline for people, and debt at the moment is relatively cheap. And so I'm not against companies with debt on their portfolio if, if they know that that discipline is leading them to make good, good investment decisions. A little bit of financial tension in some companies is good. We're seeing special dividends as a result of this to keep that financial tension in companies. Companies like Betfair have paid us specials this year, and we expect there to be more. Colin, why are you had enough of me? Let, okay. let listen to Colin for a bit. All right. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you, James. Uh, the portfolio distribution. Uh, it, it's been roughly this way for a few years now, where we've got sort of 19 percent in FTSE 100, so it's been 19 or 20, it's been 19 or 20 in FTSE 250, and the rest of the portfolio has been spread around AIM and small cap. Um, so it's completely different. It, that's, part, that's the other side of the active stance. You can see here, FTSE 100 in the all share index is 84%, FTSE 250 is 14%. Our biases are, co are completely different. You will get a very different uh, uh, return out of this portfolio over time. Um, similarly, when we look at the sector distribution, um, our portfolio has historically been quite heavy in industrials. It remains that way. We're very keen on most of the industrial companies that we see out there as survivors. They're, they're generally now very much in the sort of global forefront of high quality businesses. So as a for instance, we've got 26% weighting in industrials. The all share index has got just under 10. Um, Conversely, the all share index has got nearly 22% in financials, we've got 14. And if you go right down the bottom where in the all share index, BAT Industries and others would lurk in consumer goods, that's 15% in the all share index, it's 4% in our portfolio. So we're resolutely different and proud to be that way. Equally, that we have a huge diversity of underlying businesses within the portfolio. So if you take our top 10 holdings as at the end of last month, we go from the top 40 farmer, university spin-out, we'll talk about that later. And in fact, the university spin-outs, we've got a, a complete section on later. Um, but we've got Johnson Service, who on a domestic front is most commonly known uh, for Johnson Cleaners on the high street. But the real profit driver behind that business today is about its uh, trade and industrial laundry and its linen care for hotels and restaurants, etc. Then we've got Senior, which is an aerospace business, Ricardo, which is an automotive consultancy, and RTZ. You know, you don't find those two sitting alongside each other in many portfolios. RTZ um, and Royal Dutch Shell this year, this financial year, have been our big, biggest purchases to date. Um, we've also got Retroscreen, which we've spoken to you about before, a property company in St Modwin, an electronic uh, components business in E2V, an IP group, the university spin-out, uh, if you like, aggregator and mentor to many of the other companies in the portfolio. So I think within that you can see that there isn't any one circumstance that should come along in the market context that's going to, that's going to uh, impact any one company any more significantly uh, uh, than uh, the rest. They're all going, a lot of them are going to be dancing to their own particular tune rather than the tune of the market. Um, this is just a, a track back over the recent performance history. Uh, the share price return is the top blue line and the all share uh, index is the bottom orange stroke red line, depending on your colour preference. And here we have the discrete performances for each of the last five financial years. So generally speaking, uh, it's been a successful period for us in NAV terms and hopefully you in uh, shareholder return. Um, I think James would like to just cover a few bits on the discount. Yes, um, as the chairman said, um, the discount has returned. Um, we need to tell our story. We need to tell why this trust is differentiated perhaps from other things you're holding. Um, that it can, it can add balance to your portfolio. I see one or two people from marketing in, in the audience that help us tell that story. Um, and we have a large marketing department at Henderson's to try and, 
tell the story because we think it's a story worth telling. I'm slightly reverted to my marketing to what I was doing 25 years ago. 25 years ago at Henderson's to tell the story of investment trusts, we used to go to share clubs and um, we used to talk at share clubs and in return the share club used to buy some of our stocks. Um, I've gone full circle, I'm back drinking warm beer in pubs at share clubs, talking stocks and it's actually the marketing I most enjoy and it's not just the warm beer, it is that there are very good ideas coming out of out of share clubs, the people that are working in businesses that see comp their competition, know what's happening in the underlying economy. Um, it's not probably going to share clubs and drinking warm beer probably isn't the answer to our market. I see the head of marketing in the right here. Um, probably not the answer to Henderson's marketing problems. But it is what it is what something like HOTS are all about. It's about share individual shareholders. We're not going to get big institutional holders. It's not, we, that's not what we were designed for. We were designed for individual investors to get something different in their portfolio that will add real value over time and um, do perform better <coughs> than an index type product. A, a share club is a group of friends who put some money into a pot and um, you usually meet in the pub once um, a month and they then decide what shares they're going to buy with it. How it works for me is the, the ones that I'm on and um, they buy, they put half that pot into one of my funds and they then punt around buying shares in individual companies with the other half and they then look at me and say we've beaten you last month James <laughs> <laughs> or they go oh James I'm, I'm, I'm glad you do something when you go to work um, and um, and and it's 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 great for me because I hear what I hear you they're usually doing very well when the bull market gets really going and people and these these clubs grow um, but it, you do see the swing in emotion and you actually brings you back to what investing is all about because when I'm here I'm talking risk and relatives there you're talking absolute returns and companies and at the end of the day it is about companies and absolute return that, that matters so um, th that's why I do it I, I, and what I'm sort of saying is it is it's spreading it's talking about hot I think it's those type of people that say oh actually I'll have some more Henderson Opportunity shares that will drive the discount away over time. James, yeah. <laughs> well, I have to buy them drinks when I'm down the tables, Paul. Well, but no, when I'm up the tables, they buy me the drink. The other thing I noticed is that you were saying now you're going on to beer. Hmm. I, mean, I remember three years ago you did this presentation on majestic wines. That's well down the table. Yeah. Is it now well out of favour? Well, and it's uh, uh, well out of the portfolio. Thanks yeah. to Colin, Paul. Yes, yeah, it's gone. It's gone. It went before the last no. sound. I mean, it is interesting that Paul. I mean, we Colin held we held majestic wines a long time, um, but we did reduce and we did s sell it. Companies do have their lives. It's a great company, Majestic. It could easily come back again, but the the success of it breeds competitors, it, the, the world changes and something like Aldi coming along and having smart wine clubs and selling smart wine, you've got to be observant of that. Going to share clubs actually helps you with that. When they, when, when they say to you at a share club, I'm no longer buying a case from Majestic, I've joined the Aldi wine club, you know problems. Mm. And that's what we saw, didn't we? The, yeah. the, the, the Aldi wine club was, or was it the Little Wine Club? Little, Little Wine Club, sorry. Colin, let's, let's talk about last year's stocks. Okay, um, thanks, James. Uh, for those who did manage to get along to last year's AGM, which I think was interrupted by tube strikes or something, um, uh, then they would have seen a presentation where we just went over three stocks. We typically do it every year. Majestic Wine was one from a few years before. Um, last year we looked at XP Power, uh, which is a power supplies business actually headquartered and based out of Singapore, but UK listed. Uh, we also uh, looked at AstraZeneca and we looked at Oxford Instruments. So we'd just like to say, well, what happened to those stocks over the last year? Um, XP Power, which is the middle blue line, uh, the middle blue line as it tracks across, had a good year. It's, it's reasonably, uh, it's sort of um, sensitive to uh, global, global uh, capital goods markets. 
it's less sensitive than it was to the, uh, to the semiconductor industry, and much more sensitive now to long-run medical equipment uh, manufacturers. So it's actually going to have a less volatile history going forward, but it's going to have, uh, char keep its characteristics of growing its top line at 5 or 6 7% a year, great margins, great cash flow, great dividends, good upgrades. Um, it'll soon be cash rich. Um, it's done a fantastic job of re-engineering its business. We sold a little bit of stock, as you see on that blob there, uh, in the early part of the year, but we've kept the vast majority of the holding for the rest of, the, uh, of this year, and we intend to do so for the future. AstraZeneca was a good friend to us last year, uh, in particular a colleague that uh, James works with, Laura, uh, had a lot of input into the purchase of Astra. Um, it was identified for the very reason that Pfizer later identified it, um, that, the, uh, that the portfolio of, of, of products uh, coming through, probably from 2017 onwards, particularly in the oncology space, were looking highly promising. It was going to turn round a falling top line, which is still falling, uh, for AstraZeneca. Um, so neatly purchased at the beginning of the year. Pfizer then came along, sort of crystallised in market pro share price terms much of the future or immediate upside value that we saw. Um, and uh, we sold out uh, during that period and not long before the sort of the Pfizer deal went away. Whether Pfizer will come back or not, I really don't know. Uh, they may do. But hopefully uh, Astra can stay independent and demonstrate that it does have a great oncology portfolio. The most disappointing stock of last year was Oxford Instruments. Uh, this is, on the UK stock market, the original university spin-out the very first company to be listed as a spin-out from university. Um, Oxford Instruments' primary focus these days is in nanotechnology tools for, the, for in industry and for global research organisations, so universities, etc. Um, it's had a slightly difficult period running through the last year. We saw and we bought stock in the Q3 of last year. Um, off of the back of the Q3 results, where the company had seen a first uptick in its order book for uh, about 18 months. We also met the management, and they were definitely in the best frame of mind they'd been for 18 months. So we thought we'd add a few shares. Um, unfortunately, that all went slightly pear-shaped about eight weeks later, when um, a little bit of Russian sanctions and a little bit of deferral of order book, as they had seen it in uh, Q3, uh, didn't come through into Q4 or into the New Year sales. So we've stuck by it. I think we're putting greater pressure on management to improve uh, their visibility and forecastability of the business. Um, we think it's got a great future, and we think that the business that Oxford is today, which earns sort of you know high, uh, sorry, mid-teens margins, in the fullness of time, should be a 20% margin business. But we're going to take a couple of years yet to get there. Um, we should move on to university spin-outs very quickly. This is about 17% of the portfolio, uh, and it covers a whole range. Uh, so in the, in, in the industry distribution that we showed you before, these companies will be scattered across all of the various uh, market sectors. Um, so it, it doesn't have a separate, uh, there isn't a separate sector for it, but it's scattered across the other sectors. We've already spoken in the past about RetroScreen, an IP group. IP group is a FTSE 250, uh, 800 million market cap business um, with a whole range of uh, university spin outs where it's invested and nurtured those businesses, uh, some to trade sales, many to listings in the UK. And their biggest investment is Oxford Nanopore, which is valued at a couple of billion dollars, and its peer company listed on the US stock market is valued at $30 billion. So that's the sort of scale of opportunity that we're trying to get exposure to. Uh, more recently, we've invested in Oxford Pharma Science and a recent IPO in Horizon Discovery. Horizon, neat little business, gene editing, screening technology for pharma companies trying to advance personalised medicines. So I think this all points to sort of businesses that should have, could have great futures. Um, the next three we're going to cover in a little bit of detail for each one, 4D Pharma, Velocis and Traxis. Now 4D Pharma is the largest stock in the portfolio, it's been very successful for us. Uh, investment of just shy of a million pounds at float is now our biggest investment in the portfolio. Um, what's got the market very excited 
This is a new class of therapeutic drugs effectively using the bacteria from your own gut as, as, the, uh, as the catalyst uh, for treatment. It's also an area that's increasingly uh, focused around the globe. So, for instance, last year, late last year, Janssen, a, a, a J and J company, uh, acquired uh, uh, a business with one product, and 4D Pharma have many. That's their products, not even in clinical trials yet. This 4D will have at least one in human trials this year, and they paid 250 million dollars for the privilege. So we think this is an undiscovered gem. Um, it's now at the sort of, it's a decent sized risk within the portfolio. It won't go from a risk perspective, uh, we'll keep it in under control uh, and we will, uh, uh, in any further success, we will probably uh, keep that, keep the lid on the holding from a risk perspective. But we think it's got a fantastic future. Crohn's disease, ulcerative <coughs> colitis, etc., is the space where it's targeting initially. Um, don't bother looking at the website on Fardy Pharma because they're really trying to keep their, their light under a bushel. Um, Velocis, AIM listed again. Again, this is, a, this is an IP group spin-out. Um, this is about gas-to-liquids technology, so taking stranded gas, converting it into a high-value lubricant or fuel. Um, it recently won its first commercial contract with Waste Management Inc. of America. Um, the recent setback in the share price is to do with the oil and gas uh, arbitrage. So the lower the oil price goes, the less, less arbitrage potential there is in the marketplace. But as we know, there's an awful lot of gas in the States now, and they're going to need a higher value uh, product, end product, to deal with that and monetize some of their stranded gas. It's got a good shareholder list, recently raised 60, uh, more money from shareholders. So you need that for a business where you're not profitable yet. Uh, 60 million pounds on the balance sheet. That will see it good and clear for the next few years. I take it that this buys gas from producers rather it, than uh, producers. It, yes, it will do. Yeah, exactly that. And the idea is that the, the plants that they have, because it's a small scale plant, therefore instead of having to invest billions in a shell inspired gas to liquid plant, this will be in the 50 to 100 million dollar range, which will then allow an area of otherwise stranded gas to be monetized and converted into high value liquids. The gas that would otherwise be flared, is it? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly that. Yeah. So you see those air, those pictures from space of the bark and it, oil, uh, the bark and gas fields and the flaring going up in North Dakota. It's that sort of thing that you would get. Well, it's you know it's being wasted at the moment. And it's warming the world. You know this this is this is it has real environmental. Hmm. benefits to, if you could then use it particularly in, in waxes and things like that rather than flaring yeah next is Traxxas which is uh, again one of the IP spin outs although this one we didn't buy at float when it was spun out from IP group we actually came across this some little while later in a separate trawl of meetings uh, as we do um, it's uh, it's got a recently enhanced uh, 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 chairman's position with a good and experienced, in fact he's the chairman of Ashted, uh, current chairman of Ashted, um, that is, so there's an Ashted connection here, but he's also the founder and, and CEO of WSP. Um, a good compliment to a very young, enthusiastic, aggressive entrepreneur, John MacArthur, who runs the business as the CEO. What does it do? It's a software consultancy. It's a software consultancy in that it has some special pieces, or its original software was to do with scheduling and rostering of rolling stock and staff. More recently, it's moved into the physical monitoring equipment for the rail industry. So what it does, it puts a piece of kit down by the side of the track, monitors the, the points to make sure that they're operating and functioning appropriately, and then raises the red flag when they start to deviate outside their their, uh, their norm. So the idea is it's about preventative maintenance, keeping the track up and running. It's been a very successful uh, investment for us. Um, compound annual growth of 18%, highly cash generative, highly profitable. It's in use by Network Rail, this monitoring equipment that is, and the company are now taking this to America where they're beginning to pick up some initial orders and hopefully in the fullness of time you know, we'll have uh, some customers in America that are as big as Network Rail. And lastly, just to say that you know it's not all about university spin-outs. You know, we've recently bought some Burberry. Uh, 
This is a FTSE 100 company. Um, there isn't another luxury goods business listed in the UK other than Mulberry. And that, frankly, you can't, it's very difficult to buy Mulberry and you'd have to put up with a 56% 56, 56 majority shareholder based in Malaysia. So anyway, um, <coughs> luxury goods, why do we like it? From a financials perspective, cash positive, making around 16% margin. That's under the sector average, so we think they can earn more margin. Yesterday's Hermes figures showed that that business is earning 33% margins. Now, this is not Hermes product, obviously. It's not the Hermes price at point, but it can certainly earn better than 16% margin. Um, why we also like it is they're very engaged on the digital front. So when, London, when the London fashion show is on, they have uh, Twitter feeds and everything else going on such that you could actually buy the product you see on the catwalk then and there by utilizer, utilizing your Twitter feed. They've taken back control of their fragrance division. They're also reorganizing their uh, Japanese franchises. So gaining more control over the whole of their business. And we mentioned Hermes. LVMH were recently uh, debarred for the next five years from acquiring Hermes, as they would love to do. Um, you know, LVMH is a very rich company. It's got five years to twiddle its thumbs. You know, it, it, Burberry would be a bite-sized fit for somebody like LVMH. So for all those things, we think, you know, we like it. And I'll hand it back to James. You just thought Colin knew something about fashion, the way he was going on about them. <laughs> but as you can see, we neither of us are, neither of us are a clue. Um, but um, <laughs> this, this, this portfolio is unconstrained. We, we are looking at valuations because however much you like a company, the price you pay matters. We are seeing opportunities in the, these smaller caps because the rating, the valuations are relatively under-demanding. I know some of you were at an investment trust presentation this morning. I think perhaps they were saying the, the, the same sort of thing, that you, there, is, there is opportunity in AIM because it's fallen out of favour. The multiples have fallen to low levels, yet the next generation of really good smaller companies will be on there. But there are, as I say, a thousand companies on AIM and there's a lot of rubbish. Our job is to try and go through the rubbish and find, find, find the worthwhile ones. And in that process, we <coughs> will buy some rubbish. You know, we will, but we must, what do you do about that? We have to admit to mistakes. It's really good working with such an experienced board as, as you have with HOT. They, they understand mistakes will be made. They'll ask perceptive questions. Over, but they'll also, because we just had a good debate this morning, they'll also ask about risk and the control of risk. And to really understand risk, you actually have to understand all the different, different bits of the portfolio, how they all come together. So something like that 4D, it has run up a long way and we will reduce it into strength. We will, but we will leave it quite a long while. You know, longer than you would perhaps in an open-ended fund or in a fund that everyone was looking over the index looking over their shoulder at what index returns were in the short term. We are taking a longer view. At the same time, we have to be mindful of the overall risk of risks in the portfolio. So, it, and it, it is, for me and Colin, really good to have a debate with an, an experienced board as, such as at Henderson. At the end of the day, they leave it to us, the stock picking, and they, un but as I say, they give us that freedom that uh, we really appreciate. So, the, 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 why, why can, do we think we can add value in that smaller company space? We think we can add value, hopefully, across the market, and we will show the board how we're doing in the what, FTSE 100 companies. And if we add a bit of value there, we'll never get the same outperformance against the 100 with our 100 with our large companies as we will further down, because further down things are less well researched. That's the opportunity where people aren't looking, where people have forgotten. That's where that's that's where you can buy things at the wrong price. I like it when people pretend they don't own a share, and that's happening. You know, it's been so horrid, so horrid. The fund manager pretends he doesn't own it. He said, "I remember you've still got some of that oil exploration company, haven't you?" Oh, you say so. I'm not sure. I like that when people really don't own them. 
that is when you often find the bottom. And that's what's happening in some of the oil exploration companies. So we, at the moment, are going through oil exploration companies looking for opportunities. It may be too early in, 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 the, stock, in the stock market sense, but you've got to be doing the work now. You've got to be adding slowly at this sort of time. And we've got some that are, and we believe that they'll come right, companies like Faro in the portfolio. So overall, we're, we're positive. That's why we've got the 18% gearing. It's because we're borrowing the money at 1.5%. The, the stocks we're owning, on average, are yielding 2.5%. So they're more than washing their face without making any capital appreciation. And we think a lot of them will be substantially bigger businesses in time. Some will disappoint us. But on aggregate, we believe that they will be substantially bigger businesses in time. Therefore, we're going to keep with this reasonably high level of gearing. We're going to keep with a portfolio that's got real variety because that's the real protection. Unlike perhaps the trust you were seeing, this, somebody saw this morning, we're not buying any protection. We're running long only, but our capital protection comes from the diversity of the holdings, the diversity of the companies we hold. Some will go wrong, as I say, but, but they're unrelated. If they go wrong, it will be stock specific reasons in, in lots of cases. We're not tied to the economic activity of the economy all, all the time. Um, though we've got industrials, economic activity um, will not affect what happens to 4D pharma. It's either got something in Crohn's disease um, or it hasn't. It, it, won't be, it, it won't be that Mr Cameron loses 10 Downing Street that affects the price. It will be that the science isn't as good as we think it is. It is that kind of is that kind of diversity in the portfolio that we think is is important. So me and Colin have fired up about where we are. We're looking forward to to talking about it again in the future. And we think that in this portfolio there are going to be some good stock winners.